meeting of the New Orleans City Council is hereby called to order. Uh, we will operate under the guidelines dictated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Those require us to meet virtually. We cannot meet safely in the council chamber, so we will continue to follow the guidelines that are provided by the Attorney General as a refresher for the public. At the beginning of the meeting, the council staff will read the agenda for today's meeting in its entirety. That agenda is also available online at council.nola.gov. Anyone wishing to comment on any agenda items should go to council.nola.gov and fill out an online public comment form. Only written public comments will be accepted. Public comment will be limited to one comment per person per item. Comments should also be limited to two minutes when read aloud and be germane to the agenda issue at hand. Public comment will be closed at the end of the 10 minute public comment period. This will be announced and no written comments will be accepted beyond that point. Before voting on an agenda item, council staff will read any public comment received or the pending agenda item. So with that, um, roll call please. Councilmember Banks, Chair, present. Councilmember Moreno. Councilmember Gisson Palmer. Present. Councilmember Brosett. Present. Councilmember Wynn. Present. We have four members and a quorum. Thank you. So with that, um, Paul, if you would please read the agenda. The agenda for the Tuesday, April 13th, 2021 community development meeting is as follows. Item one, roll call. Item two, approval of the minutes from the March 3rd, 2021 meeting. Item three, COVID-19 vaccination update. Presenter, Dr. Jennifer Avegno, Director, City of New Orleans Health Department. Item four, OPSB Harris allocation. A presentation outlining the ways in which OPSB utilizes funding provided by the Harris ground lease. Presenter, Dr. Henderson Lewis, Jr., Superintendent of New Orleans Public Schools. Item five, consideration of motion number M21131 for the allocation of funds from Harris to the Orleans Parish School Board. Item six, investing in early childhood education. A presentation on the need to enhance opportunities for New Orleans youth in their first 1300 days, the most important time to start a path to equity. Presenters, Thelma French, President and CEO of Total Community Action, Inc. Rochelle Wilcox, Executive Director of the Wilcox Academy Early Learning Center. Item seven, the New Orleans Public Library High School Degree Program. A presentation on the spots purchased for career online high school and on the program that provides accredited online high school diplomas and career certificates and is offering full ride scholarships to students. Presenter Gabriel Morley, Executive Director of the New Orleans Public Library. Item eight, adjournment. Oh, thank you. Um, with that, uh, can I get a motion to approve the minutes from the March 3rd meeting? Can I, so I'll make the motion. Can I get a second? So moved. I second. All right, thank you. All in favor of approving minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so folks with that, we will I uh, need a motion for a 10-minute recess to get public comment. Um, I move. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. Paul, what time will we be back? Back at 10.15. All righty. Thank you. We will stand at recess for public comment until 10.15. Thank you all.
Okay, it is uh, 10 15 and we have recess for the required period for public comment and now we will proceed with the agenda. Uh, so with that, uh, our first presenter is Dr. Jennifer Begno, the director of the health department and Dr. Ben uh, Begno, welcome and good morning. Good morning, council member Banks and all of the council members. Thank you for having me here today. Um, there's certainly a lot to talk about today about vaccines. I'll just start uh, by giving a quick update on our COVID outbreak status. Um, we are in a, in a, we remain in a good place. We have held very steady in terms of our cases. Our hospitalizations remain low, uh, which is excellent. I think it's got a lot to do with the fact that we are continuing to wear masks and distance and, and observe precautions as well as our increasing vaccination rates. Um, right now, CDC estimates that about 13% of the virus cases in Louisiana are the B117 variant, which we know is more transmissible and is sparking outbreaks in the uh, upper Midwest and the Northeast that are resulting in another surge. Um, they have rates about 75% or so of that variant. Uh, ours are much lower and that's fantastic and we want to keep it that way. As of now, we do not know of any other variants that are circulating in Louisiana, but the sequencing is still a bit challenging. So we continue to um, follow that very closely. Uh, in terms of vaccinations, again, we know that vaccinations are our best way out of the pandemic. We also know that they're not the only thing. And so as we vaccinate more and more people, uh, keeping masks and keeping distancing will save more lives. There is a lot of evidence to support this. So it's all hand in hand and it's progressive. Um, and that's the, that's the best advice that we're getting from CDC and others. And so we are going to follow that. Right now in Orleans Parish, as of yesterday, we have initiated a vaccine series on a little bit over 40% of our entire population. That translates into a little bit over 50% of all of our eligible adults. And even better news, 70% of our seniors 70 and above have initiated vaccine. These are very, very strong numbers. Certainly for our seniors, that's very close to herd immunity in that population. And so we're really excited about that. We have all these numbers and more on our NOLA Ready dashboard for anybody who would want to see them. 
Um, although we're excited about 40%, we've completed vaccines on about 28%. So we're still only a quarter of the population um, who are fully protected at this point. And again, that does not include our children younger than 16. So again, overall, we're, we're quite pleased. We're doing very well. We're one of the top performers in the States. When you look at other cities, we are, we are one of the top performers, I believe, for other cities our size. And so I have to commend our healthcare providers, FQHCs, um, pharmacies, everyone that has been working so hard since December to get this out uh, and get it everywhere in our community. And I have to commend our residents for really showing up. You know, underneath those positive numbers, though, remain some concerning trends. Uh, now also available on our dashboard is the breakdown of vaccine uptake by census tract. So you can look at your neighborhood and you can see how many folks in your neighborhood have accessed vaccine and how many have not. There remain areas of low uptake that are of great concern because in many cases, these are areas that had very high COVID burdens. And so they're certainly the folks we would wanna get vaccinated as soon as possible. We've got a concerted effort uh, with many providers uh, going into those, identifying those areas and going in and bringing vaccine to those areas. Uh, we're doing a ton of outreach before those events and also in general on the ground, getting the word out about the many, many different ways to access vaccine. Uh, we still have free Uber rides that are available for anyone to get back and forth as well as RTA providing service. So we are again trying to remove barriers, but we know that this last mile Will be, um, will be quite challenging. Uh, there's a lot of education that still needs to happen. And I think it happens best at, on the ground or casual conversations between trusted providers, uh, primary care physicians, et cetera. Uh, so we know we have a long way to go to reach that herd immunity number that we're shooting for, where between 70 to 80% of our population is vaccinated. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about the news today about Johnson & Johnson. So Johnson & Johnson, as you know, is the most recently um, emergency use authorized vaccine. It has a lot of uh, things going for it, namely it's highly effective uh, against hospitalizations and deaths. It's one shot. There are less onerous uh, requirements for refrigeration and storage, which really made it appealing for large events, uh, for events in community. Like many folks might have seen our Shots for Shots event at the Dragon's Den. Um, there are other events that happened with Johnson & Johnson. What happened this morning is that the CDC and the FDA uh, recommended a pause in the use of Johnson & Johnson while they investigate some very rare side effects. So as of today, 6.8 million people in the U.S. have received Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Of those 6.8 million, there have been six identified cases of a rare form of blood clots, and we know that one person has died. If you think about that, the, the risk of contracting COVID and dying from COVID and unvaccinated is far higher than one in a million. However, out of an abundance of caution, which is absolutely the right thing to do, the CDC and the FDA are investigating this to see if there's a particular pattern, to see what the, um, what the physiologic reasoning for this is and whether that would change their recommendation. Uh, I've spoken to most of our large providers and small providers. All of us are, of course, following the science, following the FDA, and we will be pausing our Johnson & Johnson vaccine operations uh, until we understand the risks and benefits more clearly. Um, for those who have gotten Johnson & Johnson in our community, again, there have been no cases identified in Louisiana of this rare side effect. It is incredibly rare. Just to give you uh, sort of a, a comparison, a risk of, your risk of dying in a car accident is about one in 7,000. This risk of the J&J &J complication is one in a million. So it's, it's, you know, it is rare, but we want to take it seriously. If you've gotten Johnson & Johnson, please Monitor yourself for symptoms. If you start to have any concerning symptoms, please call your healthcare provider or access healthcare. But again, it is very unlikely that you will experience one of these. What we will do is shift um, any, any events that we're planning to use Johnson & Johnson to either Pfizer and Moderna. 
which we have plenty of. Um, and so we're able to do that quite seamlessly. It's just a little more logistically challenging given that it's two doses and we have to sort of set up other things, but we are committed and prepared to do that. We'll be having lots of conversations. We'll um, be talking to experts in the field of hematology who can help us understand what this side effect is. And so we'll be providing more information there. Um, we really do see, again, vaccinations as our way out. I want to commend the businesses that are helping to get their employees protected by incentivizing them. We've heard of several large hotels who are providing their employees with paid leave to go get uh, vaccinated or even other incentives to um, make it as easy as possible. We're seeing great uptake. That helps us get far closer to be able to fully reopening. Um, and so we want to encourage businesses, if you're thinking about, uh, you know, ways to protect your employees, what can you do to make it as easy as possible? Um, we're happy to help you uh, think through incentives as, as much as possible. And finally, I just want to point out that at NOLA Ready, we now have a calendar of vaccine events. Um, if you go to NOLA Ready and vaccine, you, um, and I can put the link in the chat in a minute, you can uh, click on the calendar, you can see events every day. These are all, these are open to all. Um, some are walk-up, some re require registration, but most, most now are uh, walk-up only. You can see where it is, you can see what time, how many doses, uh, and what kind of vaccine. So it should be as easy as possible for you to get it. We're continuing to serve our homebound residents um, who can call 311 if you are homebound and do, do not have any way to get out of the house to access vaccine. We've done over 150 so far um, and we'll keep rolling uh, until we get through all of our uh, elderly patients. We've done multiple events for homeless and other individuals that might have challenges uh, accessing vaccine in a traditional fashion. And despite the J&J &J issues, we will continue to do those with other vaccine um, as it is appropriate. Uh, so I'm gonna stop there, Council Member Banks, unless you had anything other specific that you wanted me to touch on. Uh, no, Doc, that was uh, very comprehensive, but just a couple of questions. What portion of our vaccines locally does J&J &J comprise? I that mean, is, is it a good 10%, question. 50%, how much, how much is this going to push us back? Well, to date, it's been a very small percentage because we just received Johnson & Johnson in the last few weeks. And if you've also heard, there was an issue at their U.S. factory, so we were actually not going to receive J&J &J for the next few weeks. So I, my guess is that of all vaccines given, J&J &J is probably somewhere around 10%. What it's going to do though, is make it harder for us to do the community events that we really feel are now key. We know the mass vaccination sites are great. We know they need to continue, but we need to fill in the gaps. And it's just a lot harder um, when you have to get somebody in a certain place and then get them again three to four weeks later. We're talking to our partners to make creative solutions to do that. I fear this is just going to lengthen the amount of time it takes us to get everybody um, vaccinated. So it won't be as quick or as efficient as we wanted. And our numbers seem to be pretty good, but where does that put us on a timeline? We are ahead of where everybody expected us to be. We're where we're supposed to be. Are we behind? How are we looking in terms of timeline? That's a good question. I don't think we, I don't think anybody really knew because we didn't have benchmarks. Um, I think we're doing well. Um, we're all starting to see a slowdown. We are in the period now where our demand is less than our supply. Um, and, you know, I'm tracking week over week what our percentage of uptake is in that percent in that week. Everybody that was rushing out to get it as soon as it was available has largely gotten their vaccine. Now we've got probably about 30% or so of our population that needs more time, needs more education, needs us to come to them, needs it to be easier. And so that, that group is gonna take a lot longer than those folks who are gonna rush out and get it within the first few days. So I think we've done well with what we've had. Um, I think it's going to be a little slower going from now on. And with that 30% that needs that extra uh, coaxing, how can we help? I mean, what do we need to do to get 
the information to them. Uh, what do we need to do to help? Well, all of the council members' offices have been fantastic, as well as our neighborhood engagement. Um, you, If you haven't provided us with community groups in your area, please do so. Our um, NOLA Ready is partnering with Resilience Force uh, and other community groups to go into neighborhoods. So when we go to District B, for example, we'd love to have that neighborhood group with us handing out flyers. They're saying, oh, I know this block. I'm gonna talk to my friends on this block. And I know many of you have done that. We're gonna continue to do it. We're gonna target it. Now that we have more people, we can say, okay, we're in you know, Holly Grove today talking to you. We're actually gonna be giving vaccines in a few days. So here's how you, you know, look, you just have to go right down the street. Let's get you ready so that you can take advantage of it. So we're really trying to target the outreach to specific events, but any groups that are interested in working with us, please send them to us. And I, I know you have. We have, and we will continue. I mean, the New Zion Baptist Church calls me weekly to find out when I'm on the set. There I'm working around. on it. I, I reached out to someone about that. So. Okay. All right. Tell me about the disparity in terms of race and economics as to how we're measuring up with that, and then how do we touch those populations that are, are, are not where the others are? Yes, that uh, continues to be a source of concern for us. Um, when we look at the percentage of our white residents who've been vaccinated versus the percentage of our black residents who've been vaccinated, it's almost a two to one ratio. Um, and that is incredibly distressing because we know that our black residents have suffered the most from COVID in terms of hospitalizations, deaths, the economic fallout. Um, and we have tried really, really hard in all of our events to prioritize residents in the neighborhoods in which they live. Our events have been pretty successful at doing that, but it becomes challenging when you're talking about, you know, thousands and thousands of other vaccines. I know all of our providers are acutely focused on this. That's why we really are trying to ramp up events in the community for the community and looking at those communities who are not getting uptake, many of whom are predominantly communities of color. Um, you know, the J&J &J is a little bit of a setback for that because it just makes it harder for us to get folks vaccine in a timely manner. The other thing I think is that we just need to keep having conversations. Um, you know, our elders took the vaccine. They had, you know, they had a few questions, but they saw the benefit of taking the vaccine. Our young folks, um, in our young folks of color in particular, have a lot more questions and different questions and need more information in different ways. Um, Nola Reddy and the mayor's office are putting together a media campaign on TikTok. Uh, which I couldn't tell you how to use, but it, that's a way to reach this group. And, and we figured out their questions and are answering their questions, which are not the same as the questions we've been answering you know, previously. So it's a lot of outreach. We're working with the universities. All of them have, um, have started vaccinating their students or incentivizing their students. If we can get that critical mass of young people, then that spreads. We, again, we're really encouraging employers. If you are a, a business that employs a lot of young people, please make it easy on them. What we learned at the Dragon's Den is that it, young people who were rolling up to hear DJ Rockaway said, oh, well, I'm right here, I'll get this they would not otherwise have made it a priority in their life. So it's really putting it in places where our young people, particularly our young people of color, um, are gonna be anyway. We can have conversations on the spot, they can get it right there, and then you know they're, they're at least halfway there. It's just changing the message, changing the model. Then how important is testing? It remains important. Um, you know, so we're still keeping up with testing. Our testing is not at a level at which I would say, oh, we really don't have an idea of what's going on in the outbreak. Um, there are different places to access testing. Certainly we don't have as many community sites, but folks still seem to be uh, accessing them. And the schools now have testing that they didn't have before. So if your kid is sick in school, they can get a test right there. And that's very helpful. I think testing is going to remain important particularly for kids, 
throughout the summer and into the school year. Um, we, we think that Pfizer may be authorized for ages 12 to 15 in the next few weeks. The, the trials were really, really showed a very strong efficacy in young persons, but kids under 12, it is unlikely that a vaccine will be approved for them before the fall. Um, and what we're seeing in places like Michigan is that young kids when there is, are, are driving surges. So youth sports, kids being together. And again, kids are fine, but they're bringing it home to vulnerable family members who maybe have not been immunized yet. So I think testing, particularly of our young folks is critical. I applaud Tulane for continuing to test their folks um, on a regular basis. That has helped us tremendously as a city. Um, I don't have any other questions. Colleagues, do you have any questions for Dr. Vegna? I see Cindy. Yeah. And also, Paul, would you note that uh, both the council president and the council vice president have joined us. So check uh, the president office president and note that council member Glapion is here also. Yes, Please, uh, council member Wynn. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Vegna, I know because in District E, we just uh, just got notified that our event got canceled on Saturday because of the J and J. So we were going to partner with the New Orleans East Hospital in the East on Saturday, and then Win Dixie um, on Saturday for MLK. And so, and I'm looking at the schedule on Nola Ready, and um, I really would love to see more. Um, I see a lot of the sites, a uh, vaccine site is in like the St. Rock, the Convention Center. Tulane and stuff like that. Um, if we can, and I love to, and I know you guys have been working with us on this, how we can make sure that there's a community vaccine site in the L9 and in the East, if all possible, uh, on a regular base. Um, I know we have the hospital there, but we did face challenges with the J and J. Uh, I was hoping to get about, I think, uh, the Northern East Hospital was going to offer us about 500 shot this Saturday and Win Dixie was going to be another 200 shot, um, but they were going to use a Jane j but with the situation with a Jane j they had to cancel it. So we can talk to them, uh, you know, I, if they wanted to use Pfizer or Moderna, I could help see if we, if, if we could get somebody to transfer them those doses, if they were willing to just come back in three okay. or four weeks. So yeah. we can, I know there is another event at the, Oshner's doing an event at the East at the Breeze Family Center on the same day. Obviously they're not in the same place, um, but it, that's on Bullard, I think. That yeah. is, that is still happening. Um, I don't know that that was going to be J&J &J anyway, but as far as I know, that's still happening. Um, and I'll find out if it's not. But if you like, we can um, reconnect and see, because we were going to help, we were providing some support to that event. So we could see if maybe they would consider changing it to a different um, vaccine. I'd hate, I'd hate to cancel it. But yeah. yes, we'll continue to, you know, everything just gets a little bit harder these days um, with the loss of J&J. &J. But we're going to continue to look for areas. I have to say, if looking at the census tract maps, Councilmember Wen, I want to give you and your task force credit for this. Um, the east, you can see the progression in people getting vaccine, both in the east and in the in the ninth ward, um, and that just proves that when you put sites there, people mm -hmm. take advantage of them. Yeah. So we want to keep that progression going. Yeah, and another, I uh, just wanted to kind of put this out uh, as we discuss about how do we motivate others to take the shot. So yesterday I was on WBOK with Gerard Stevens and one of the caller called in and said, hey, I'm, I got enough information about the shot, but I'm more concerned about who's gonna give me the shot. And so Gerard kind of came up with an idea. It's like, well, what if, you know, and the, the caller recommended like if Dr. McKenna is going to give me, Dwight McKenna is going to give me the shot, then I will come in and have Dr. McKenna give me the shot. So I just thought that was a great idea where maybe we could host an event where you yourself, uh, as a well-known doctor, well-trusted doctor in our community, Dr. Keith Fournan, and, and I don't mean to throw people name out, but just keep people that really build up that trust for people that may have some concern that, well, you know what, if a particular doctor give me a shot, then um, I would take the shot. And I could tell you, I have a gentleman in the lower nine, Mr. Joseph. I went by and visit him. He is actually 80 years old. Refused to take the shot. 
but he, but yesterday when I was talking to him and I gave him that idea, he goes, Cindy, he goes, if Dr. Keith Ronan give me the shot, I will take the shot. We so can make that happen. Yeah, I love giving shots. I thought that, I thought that was a great idea as yeah. we're always thinking Celebrity about it. shots. Yeah. really encourage people to take the shot. Sure. Okay. Yeah. That sounds fun. Yeah. But thank you so much for your work and your teamwork uh, with Chantel and everybody on the team. I really appreciate it. I was supposed to go canvassing today for our event uh, for Saturday, but uh, since it's postponed, let me tell you, I'm not complaining at all. <laughs> <laughs> very well today. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I see, Kristen, are you trying to speak or are you just coming on? Thank you, thank you, uh, Councilmember Banks. Dr. Wagner, real quick, um, could you just elaborate a little bit for the public when you talk about um, the Johnson & Johnson shot? And again, if you could please restate um, the, the percentage of, of an adverse reaction and also if and when that reaction, does it happen immediately after? Does it happen a while after? So people that have already received the shot, is there a window in which that there were those um, potential blood clots. Yes, and I'll, I'll say that my knowledge is a little bit incomplete. We're just sort of going off what we've been you know, sent this morning. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to get the actual data from, from the company or the CDC. But what we know is that there have been six cases out of 6.8 million Johnson & Johnson shots administered that had a rare, that developed a rare type of blood clot um, within, they all happened uh, between women ages 18 to 48, and they all happened within two weeks of getting the vaccine. So it was not necessarily an immediate reaction, but within that first period uh, of a reaction. Um, one person has died, the others have not. The, there's a the few questions. This is a condition, this kind of blood clot does happen in the general population. So one of the questions they're going to be looking at is, is this, does this have anything to do with the shot or is it just that these folks were going to get it anyway? The thinking is that there, in, in very, very rare cases, there might be some kind of response when you receive this vaccine that predisposes you to um, having it. But again, very, very rare. We know that lots of other vaccines have very, very rare side effects. Uh, so this is not the first. Um, all of the childhood vaccines in some very small cases give very rare um, side effects. And so while the risk to an individual person is very small, when you're giving millions and millions and millions of doses, you're, you're going to see a few cases. So we're really waiting for the CDC and the FDA to do a very deep dive into the data and to come up with recommendations as to, it may be that they find that your risk of this rare complication is increased if you're in a certain age group or if you are taking certain medications and other than that, your risk is not at all increased. Um, or, it, you know, we're just sort of waiting for them to analyze the data and to let us know the best path forward. Right. So basically within two weeks of taking it. So if people mm -hmm. have gone past two weeks, three weeks, yeah. four weeks, they haven't experienced anything, they won't. It would be highly unlikely at that point for them to experience something. Thank you. Any other concerns or questions from colleagues? Well, seeing none, Dr. Begno, thank you as always. We really appreciate the information and we will continue to keep pressing. And uh, just want to emphasize to everyone listening, it is still imperative that you wear a mask, wash your hands and social distance. If you are sick, please stay home. And by all means, if you have not gotten a vaccine, please get one as soon as you can. So with that, Doc, thank you. Thank you. We will proceed with the next item on the agenda, but before we do that, I just want to make note that we received zero public comments. So there will be no public comments, um, nothing. We, we did not get any, so there are no agenda items that we'll have to uh, read because we didn't receive them. So moving on with the next presentation, that will be from Dr. Henderson Lewis, superintendent of the New Orleans Public Schools. Uh, Doc, are you here? Yes, I am, Councilman. Good morning, sir, and welcome. 
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and again, to uh, Chairman Banks, uh, members of the council, uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you this morning concerning the uh, 2020 Harris Funds allocation. As you know that over the years, uh, the Harris Fund has allowed us to serve some of our most vulnerable students. Uh, I, I provided a presentation just uh, merely for backup information about details of the program, but the three uh, ways we use the Harris dollars each year is to support our Office of Student Support and Attendance, the Center for Resilience, and the Travis Hill School. Um, I will continue to say that the Harris Dallas has continued to allow us to meet the critical needs of our students since 2004. And this morning, I'm just uh, thankful for the opportunity of it being on the agenda and acting for a, a favorable uh, vote on today uh, so that we can get these Dallas to our most vulnerable students as we have done since 2004. Superintendent, thank you. Uh, colleagues, do you have any questions for the superintendent? Kristen, I see you, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, uh, Dr. Henderson. Can you tell me, are y'all going to be receiving stimulus funds? So uh, the district will not be receiving stimulus fund and I can briefly share how stimulus funds work here in the city of New Orleans when it comes down to our schools. Uh, each school, uh, as they would normally do their federal applications each year to receive federal dollars, the dollars from the stimulus funds are going to be directly sent to our schools the same way they sent to them each and every year. There's a, a few schools that we do some additional service for uh, that we will be receiving about 2.5 or so million dollars over a four year period with these funds because we will receive the indirect costs for doing their uh, federal grant application. But to answer the question directly, uh, because we are decentralized school districts, our uh, funds go directly to the schools and then we work in conjunction with our schools to make sure that the guidelines are being followed and that uh, we are able to implement those funds in the way that they were intended. So so this grant, I mean, so the, this, this Harris money is proposed to be used for the Travis Hill School? So, uh, for the last several years, uh, as we uh, together, the school system and the council, uh, we have three priorities how these funds were used in the past. Uh, one has been the Travis Hill School. The other is the Center for Resilience. And the third, it used to be called the Youth Opportunity Center. Right now is our Office of Student Support and Attendance, which really uh, uh, house our social workers and in, in, in the citywide efforts that they do to support our struggling students. So the question is, um, aren't they eligible also for stimulus funds? Who is eligible for stimulus funds? Well, the Travis Hill School for one, the, the prison, the, the jail, I should say. So the, the prison, the jail, again, uh, let me just back up before stimulus even happened. Um, because the Center of Res for Resilience, as well as the Travis Hill School, we know that those are very important, very important programs. However, the allocation for the number of students that they have if you're gonna operate a school, you have to have a certain number of students. So that's why we have partnered with the council over the years, even before COVID even happened, because we do know when you work with that population, uh, it costs more than you will ever receive to be able to support our students that attend even the Travis Hill School or the Center for Resilience as an example. Is there going to be, I, I would still like to know, um, uh, Chairman, like an overall, before we even approve anything, um, to, to see an overall use of funds, when we talk about stimulus funds also for the jail, I'm assuming that they are getting stimulus funds. I would also like to see what kind of programming is going to be happening this summer um, with all of our schools. I'm very concerned about our youth and a lot of our children that have been left behind because of COVID. And, um, and virtual learning. I know some schools have lost up to 20% of their students. And before we, we approve any type of funding, I really think that we need to have a broad picture on how resources are going to be given to our, all of our students, all of our children um, over the summer. That's my primary concern right now. And I'd like to see a really clear plan. I would hope um, Dr. Henderson that you are helping coordinate, granted that y'all don't have control over any schools, if that's correct, that y'all are still helping coordinate the use of these monies for summer enrichment programming throughout the, um, the city. 
Yeah, so, so a, a few things I will say. So first of all, um, yes, we are coordinating. We coordinate with our schools uh, in many ways, and in particular around the learning loss for our students in the summer program, but also the funds that uh, we're talking about today is being allocated if it moves forward. That's for the current school year that ends on June 30th. So these uh, funds are in our current budget because each year, uh, again, since 2004, uh, we've had this partnership. So the acts that I'm asking for a favorable recommendation on today is actually for our operating budget for the school year that's ending this school year. It just usually will come each year in the month of March, uh, between March and May for uh, funds to be allocated for the upcoming school year. And so we're actually doing this task right now uh, that usually would have happened in the spring of 2020. So the acts today is actually uh, in terms of this current school year. Councilmember Banks, is that, is that correct? I thought this money hasn't been allocated and it still needs to go. It, it's not a guaranteed. We, we kind of established that last year. Isn't that correct? Or two years ago? It is certainly not a guarantee. It has been a practice, but it is not a guarantee. It's within the council's purview to determine whether or not uh, it, it will be issued and the amount that issued and to whom it's issued. The lease calls for the funds to be used for education, but it doesn't specify an entity or a purpose for the money, just that it has to be for education. So um, that part is true. It is not a lock. Uh, but in terms of the information that you're requesting, would that be something that he can provide you prior to the council meeting or you want that done at a council meeting or at a community development meeting or is it, tell me how you want to do it and, and we will ask that the information be provided to you. I think this is a hugely important issue. I'm not sure if the public is aware of the amount of stimulus dollars that are going to each individual school. Um, and I am very, very concerned, I think all of us are, about children that have been left behind through COVID. And I'm really concerned about this summer and summer programming. I would like maybe a presentation at, at the council meeting um, that maybe Dr. Henderson can, can give us about the uh, allocation of funds throughout the district and how much all these schools are receiving and what types of things um, can be done with this money over the summertime. Um, I'm going to be very clear. Um, it, it's wonderful that um, we now have a youth master plan about our resources. And first off, it's based on demographic information about where our children live and reside. Overwhelmingly, they reside and live in New Orleans East and in Algiers. And if you look at those two areas geographically, there are not enough resources for our children, um, especially for enrichment services, for NORD programming, um, and for summer. And so I would really like to see how some of these schools are going to be utilizing these funds to open up these beautiful facilities that we have um, for our children over the summer um, to provide types of enrichment activities. So I would, I would rather see before we move this forward and along to have the opportunity for the public to hear on what type of resources are going to our children. Because my understanding is that our, our different schools will get anywhere up to over $3,000 additionally per student. Um, and so I think that we should start talking about what's going to happen this summer um, for our kids. Superintendent, would you be able to make that presentation at the council meeting? Uh, I, I guess I've, I, I have a, a question, first of all, um, when it comes down to uh, presenting um, the federal government has made it very clear what these funds can be utilized for. We work with our schools here at NOLA Public Schools, uh, and we will be opening uh, our doors for our students and families. Uh, our teachers have done an amazing job, and I, I just want to uh, say this morning that even though I hear Councilman uh, Member uh, Palmer's questions on today, uh, but our schools are doing a lot to make sure that our students are, are, are being engaged and doing a very difficult time in putting programming together that has been actually guided by our State Department of Education to not only bring students in to be able to uh, 
cover English math, you know, the usual, but also to make it fun opportunities because we know that this has been a mental strain on all of us. And so our schools, we have worked with our schools, so I can provide the information. But I guess the question I have is in terms of the allocation today of the $1.5 million as it continues to go to the council, uh, that we're on the same page that in, in my mind, uh, this request today is in terms of this current school year. Uh, so I understand you would like to learn more about our program and what's happening, but uh, again, as I shared also, before. Yes, but also whether or not, I mean, because I'm assuming you, you spent the money without it being approved. Is that, is that, I'm sorry, is that what I'm hearing? So uh, again, each year uh, we would normally get $3 million from Harris. And so as we prepared the, our budget last spring, uh, that amount was in there. Again, like right now, we're preparing for the upcoming school year. And so even today, uh, even though we're talking about uh, this current time frame, you know, uh, also want to know from the council moving forward, will uh, should we as a school district uh, uh, be able to uh, count on the allocation for the spring? Uh, excuse me, for next school year, or, or should we have a, some kind of other discussion moving forward uh, as, as far as this partnership that we've had for the last, uh, since uh, 2004, uh, I, I know the Harris lease has changed. And so just want to understand even moving forward. So at the district level, we can, we can plan uh, effectively uh, even for next school year as well. Well, I think, I think um, Dr. Henderson, I know this council has been very um, proactive in early childhood education. And it's something I know Councilmember Banks and many of us have been, um, you know, and even, you know, council member um, Jason Williams under his leadership before a lot of us came onto this council, um, we've all been pushing, and I know um, council member Set have all been pushing money to go towards early childhood education. And we had this conversation, I think it was over a year ago that we really wanted to set this money aside for early childhood education. Is, is that correct? Am, am, I, am I not? Reading this correctly, Councilmember Banks, I can't remember. You, you are correct. Um, and as for the question as to moving forward, no, there will need to be discussions. I would not make the assumption that it's going to be automatic. Uh, we can certainly have the conversations, but no, I don't think that the, the path is going to be that it will be an automatic allocation of the $3 million for what has been previously uh, dispersed. Moving forward, um, no, we will definitely have to have conversations as to how that money can best be utilized. Because right. I'm also concerned, you know, we, we've been having these discussions and then obviously with the millage that did not pass, I know early we were anticipating that 1.5 million also, I think we were still looking, is that correct, Councilmember Banks, for early childhood education? Yes. So I, I just find it that we need to look at our, our limited resources, um, what the value system of this council is in terms of early childhood education, and then also the needs that need to be addressed holistically for our children that have been negatively impacted by COVID-19, I would just hate to rush into something until we get more information. And if I may, also, I wanna uh, share uh, this morning, even as I, I know the, the council and early childhood education is a priority. Also here in the school district, it is a priority of course for us as well. And I just wanna share this morning that I hosted our state superintendent on this past Friday, uh, also with the superintendent of Cattle Parish, East Baton Rouge and Jefferson Parish. And collectively these four parishes, we actually uh, account for 25% of the students here in the state of Louisiana. And the visit that took place on Friday was solely on early childhood education. And so our state superintendent and the uh, superintendents from the uh, other largest districts in the state uh, were able to uh, visit uh, four of our schools and had the opportunity to visit our early childhood ed education classes from pre-K to third grade because our state superintendent is working with all districts in the state of Louisiana to understand how do we collectively come together uh, to be able to support early childhood education. Of course, I believe everyone on the council knows that when it comes down to pre-K four, the school system, actually we have the majority of those students, even though we don't receive 
uh, total funding for those students because our funding that we receive is for at our elementary level from kindergarten through eighth grade because we have K-8 schools. And so what our schools do is take uh, the LA4 grant that many of them receive, as well as sometimes with our partnerships through New Schools for New Orleans who may give additional support to fill the gap because we don't get full funding to do our pre-K-4 program. And if they don't get that, they're using the money that's allocated for their um, kindergartens through eighth grade students to make sure that we're also doing our part. And so as superintendent, I would love to see us the day where even in our city, we have universal pre-K like some places have. And so again, I, I believe that we all want the same thing and I look forward to working together as we come together to tackle early childhood education as a community issue because there's no uh, funding stream in any parish to be able to fund early childhood, early childhood education at this time. Kristen, are you, are you good or you got more questions? No, I'm, I'm good. I think we just, we should bring all of this in front of the, the full council unless, unless, you know, it's the wish of, of the rest of my council members, but I, I would like to. Have then then let me, let me understand procedurally and Paul, I add them, somebody uh, chime in. Do we have to pass this today in order to take it up on the council's agenda or do we pass it and put it on the regular agenda to have it discussed or do we just put it on the council agenda. Tell me procedurally, what do we need to do um, so that the debate can happen and the information be provided, but it still be a legislative item that would be approved if the information is satisfactory to the people on the council to be able to move forward with it. What do we need to do? So if the committee uh, votes to recommend approval today, it does not have to go on the consent agenda. We can place it on the regular agenda for consideration um, at the next regular council meeting or the committee can uh, can move it to the full council without a recommendation either way um, and it could appear on the regular agenda uh, for consideration then. So which one is the better path to take? I don't want to do anything that's going to put us in jeopardy. So which is the which is the cleanest way to get it to the full agenda so that it can be vetted at the council meeting and the information requested can be provided, but it's not obligating us to do yay or nay, which is the path to take. Right, so a, a recommendation from the committee, it does not obligate the council to, uh, to approve it. Um, it's just a recommendation from the, the members of the committee who, who would be at the hearing today. Uh, so you can move it to the full council either way with, with or without a recommendation. Okay, so if I move to approve it and move it to the full council uh, to recommend it, move to the full council on the regular agenda, that'll get us where we need to get, but that does not obligate the full council to vote affirmatively for it if the information isn't what they want, right? That, that's correct. We'll have another full public hearing at the regular council meeting um, where, where this will come up again for more discussion uh, and consideration by the full council. Okay, so... Procedurally, I will make the motion that we advance this to the full council to the regular agenda with the understanding that the superintendent will be there to present the information requested um, and be able to answer questions from Council Member Palmer and my other colleagues. Can I get a second? A second. Thank you, Council Member Palmer. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All righty. Thank you, folks. We will move on to the next agenda item. I'm sorry, I'm so, wait, hold on, I'm sorry. Don't we have to read it first? Paul? Um, no, sir, this was advertised as part of the agenda for today's meeting, um, so we, we don't have to read the text of it. Okay, but it was motion M21-131, just so everybody's clear on it, right. M21-131. Dash one three one, and I want to repeat: there were no public comments received for any agenda items. Okay, so with that, uh, Superintendent, thank you. We'll see you at the council meeting. And um, moving on to the next agenda item, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Thelma French, President and CEO of Silver Community Action, Miss Rochelle Wilcox, Executive Director of the Wilcox Academy Early Learning Center, and Kenny Francis, Deputy. I'm sorry, Director of Policy and Child Advocacy or agenda for children uh, to talk about just what we were just discussing, early child education and uh, opportunities for you. So with that, um, Ms. French, 
and the Good other morning. presenters. Good morning. Good morning, members of the uh, council. I mean, I'd like to thank, uh, express our appreciation to Councilman Banks and the other members of the committee for providing us the opportunity to present the importance and need to increase the availability and access to early childhood education experiences. I am joined this morning by Ms. Rochelle Wilcox, Executive Director of the Wilcox Academy Learning Center, and uh, by Mr. Kenneth Francis, the Director of Policy and Child Advocacy. We would like to focus our comments this morning about the, the need to increase access or the availability of high quality early childhood education for all children who are below the ALICE designation. That means that not just those children at 100% of poverty, but all children who are living in households that would be deemed asset limited income uh, uh, constrained employed. And I, I'm struggling with that this morning only because there is such a need in our community, even exacerbated by the economic impacts of the pandemic, that we connect all of our children between zero and three to high quality early childhood education. The brain development and research data proves that the first we increase the availability, we still haven't increased the availability of resources to meet that need. And so um, I would quote uh, one of uh, the Nobel Peace Prize economist, Jane Heckman, who said, that for each dollar spent in early childhood education, the return on investment is $13. Quality early childhood education is a jump start to success in school. We have shown that children who have had experiences of high quality early childhood education, as we talk about equity and parity in our community, the most important issue of equity or economic dignity for New Orleans is to provide for the future of our youngest citizens to provide them with the opportunity to have high quality early childhood education. I would like to recognize and acknowledge the efforts that this council has made to provide us with additional funds that have been leveraged to increase the availability, but yet we still have not met the need in our community. The slides that are passing talk about the differences between what is market rate and what is quality. And at this time, if Rochelle is still available, I know she had a conflict in meetings, I would like for her to talk about this from a provider's perspective. Good morning, again, I'm Rochelle Wilcox, the Executive Director of Wilcox Academy of Early Learning. We have three learning centers in the greater New Orleans area. And again, as Ms. French said, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today and all that the city council have done for our youngest, most vulnerable learners, um, that zero to three age range. Um, so as Ms. French said that there are high quality centers in the greater New Orleans area. However, with even a high quality center, the, the average, the quality rate is $20,000. The average that that centers are charging is $9,100. But that is that is more that's not the most centers are charging. Most centers are charging about seventy-five to seventy-eight hundred dollars. That is not the cost to increase teachers teachers pay. That is not the cost to make sure that we have proper um, buildings, infrastructure. That is That does not include the cost of making sure that we have all the materials and things that we need to increase the quality. So as we increase the rate, as we increase the quality, as teachers increase their um, credentials, we often marginalize the very children that need our high quality care. So the, the fact is, is that there is a huge gap between what it costs and what it actually, what we can actually charge a parent, a working parent, the working poor are tr just trying to make sure that their little people are going to high quality centers. The other fact is that we are constantly losing staff, not because uh, they, they don't love their job, but because Amazon is paying them more, they can afford to pay them more, or they can go to another job where they just want to meet, they just want to be able to take care of their families. 
And so the, the, there is this adverse action of high quality and then marginalizing the children that need it the most. And it often is at the sake of the directors. Like at the end of the day, over the pandemic, that I, there was no salary that I could take, but I made sure that my teachers got paid. I wanted to make sure that we wanted to keep them in this field, let them know that we care about them and they're the most essential workers. And so we wanna make sure that these people who are caring for the, our most vulnerable learners, those first 1300 days, as Ms. French called, they deserve to be paid more. We deserve, there deserves to be more access to high quality. And so that's need. As we bring our, our comments to a close, we would like to uh, talk about the fact that uh, Louisiana has made a significant increase in its pre-kindergarten programs as uh, the superintendent just alluded, pre-K three and pre-K four. And these have resulted in almost a near universal access for economically disadvantaged four-year-olds with over 95% of them being provided a seat. However, only 18% of our economically disadvantaged children under three have had a free or subsidized seat. And as uh, Rochelle just alluded, even those free and subsidized seats do not provide the funding levels necessary to sustain and maintain the high quality. We are talking about investing in closing that gap investing in a more equitable so that we can raise the quality and opportunity for all children in our community. And we are very grateful for this opportunity. We want to continue to work with the council, the state, and all of our partners to increase our investment from the beginning in the zero to three. Because if they enter four pre-K behind and never have an access, they've already on the short stool. And we want them to be on the even stool. We want them to have the opportunities to grow to their fullest potential. Can I always is, like to say that, you know, as, as Ms. French said, children are not born at four. I am, I am so happy that, you know, we all, we, we're almost at universal pre-K, but that's four years after their birth a lot of that time has closed, those brain synapses, all of the things that they are going to gain from coming to an early learning, a high quality early learning center at six weeks or two months, we've lost that. Children do not come out speaking full languages, speaking full sentences, walking, they are not born at four. So I know we say that's early child education, but early childhood education is, uh, starts at birth, before birth. So I just want to make sure that we're clear with that. And I'll just add to that, that um, to clarify, all of you guys have heard us talk about the number that 90% of brain development happens by the time a child is four. To illustrate Rochelle's point, 80% of that development happens by the time they're three. And so pre-K four is great and it's an important step, but it's just that, it's just a step. Until we have access and near universal access to care starting at six weeks, we're gonna to continue to be missing that vitally important time where that 80% of brain development is happening um, for the majority of kids whose families cannot afford it. And as a previous slide showed you, the affordability problem is enormous. The reality is that whether you are a low income, middle income, or even a wealthy family, childcare is an incredibly expensive thing. There's a reason why we need to subsidize it. Um, the analogy I like to give is the analogy of um, food. As a country, we subsidize our farmers to, to make food and it be able to sold, be sold in supermarkets and grocery stores at an affordable price because none of us could ever afford to pay the true cost of what it costs to actually grow and bring to market our vegetables. However, we can't ask people to pay $30 a pound for vegetables. No one could afford that. We would all starve. So we subsidize this essential service that we all need to thrive in order for folks to be able to afford it and for it to be available to our people. Childcare is the same thing. Every single child needs this. Every family needs availability to this. And what we have is a reality where only the wealthiest people can afford it. And even they are struggling to afford it. Uh, at this time, we, were, we I think we've concluded our comments and we are available if there are any questions. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And I appreciate each of you. I've got a couple of questions. 
how is the gap made up between market and quality? Where does that subsidy come from? So I'm going to be really blunt with you, Councilman Banks. That gap is made up on the backs of child care workers, over which 90% are women, the majority of which are Black women. That, that gap is made up by paying incredibly low wages on, on an average of $9.77 an hour to the women who do this very important work. That's where the gap is made up. So even though it is a cost difference between quality and market, the people who are getting market are still getting quality services to the children. Yes, by, uh, but, and as I said, by just underpaying the workers. I would think that most parents probably have no idea just how little money their child care is. Uh, and, Ms. Councilman, I would, I would bring that home. Uh, since three of members of the TCA board are there, most of our child care workers, even with the federally funded programs and the meager uh, 1.22% cost of living increase, majority of our uh, early Head Start and Head Start staff qualified for the programs that the other programs that the agency provide at 250% of poverty. And help me with the quality, the $20,000 provider. How do families access them? What do you, what do you go to find them? <laughs> Um, well, if you're lucky to find an open slot, because that's part of the problem, part of the problem is there's not enough supply. If you're lucky enough to find it, you just have to pay for it, Councilman Banks. You're talking about people pay on average, like if you're, there are some providers in this city that cost upward beyond $20,000 a year, and you're paying basically what you pay for your kid to go to private school for college, to go to childcare, and it's incredibly competitive. There is a, a pretty morose joke that people tell that for, off, for many families in our city, even wealthy families, the first person that knows that someone is pregnant is not their spouse, it's their child care provider, because the, it's that dire in terms of people trying to access it. And how much knowledge is in the community of the importance of early childhood education? How many families that should be involved in this process aren't taking advantage of those services that they might be able to get because they just don't know the value of it. Yeah, and so right now, I would right now there's a reality that there is that a lot of families are keeping their kids home due to the pandemic and due to fears around safety. But pre-pandemic, and we expect this to 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 be to return to the same after the pandemic. All there is always a reality where there's much more requests for access to services like Early Head Start that uh, Ms. French provides, or the type of services that Rochelle provides then they, they can fill. Just to give you an example of that, um, last spring, there was more than 700 requests for early Head Start seats than we could able to fill. And regularly, there's a wait list of thousands of kids for publicly funded seats. There's just not enough supply. And so families know the importance. Families want the, the services. There just isn't enough to serve them. And so, you know, if you're sitting on a wait list for three years and now your kid's three, are you gonna keep trying or are you just gonna wait till they go to kindergarten? And council, I would add that, you know, added to that has been the coordinated enrollment, which was designed to ensure that, that we maximize the availability of all public funded seats in the state of Louisiana. But when it comes to early childhood and coordinated enrollment, we still have work to do around parents understanding and knowledge that this coordinated enrollment at Orleans Parish includes the one app. And I think that we as our providers, as well as the uh, school system have to really find out and take the effort to understand what are the challenges parents are having and to honestly help to reduce those barriers to access the one barrier we can't reduce without additional funding is to create additional seats. But I think all other things are possible when we all work together to achieve the ultimate goal of making sure that every child that is eligible has the access to a early childhood seat. And let me ask a, a, a big picture question. I got a magic wand right now. I can wave it and make all things happen. How much is needed to be able to provide a seat for every child that needs one. What, what are we looking at? If you can go to slide six, we have that answer for you. And yeah. actually in, in several different forms. 
Uh, we're trying to get it up. Okay. So the answer, so the answer to your question is that if you wanted to serve it at the market rate to serve every child under the age of five in New Orleans, it'd be about $65 million per year. If you were going to do it at the quality rate, and remember, quality rate is like what it would take to pay people a real living wage to do the work, to do the, to have the facilities that you need, to have the, the types of accesses to materials and facilities and staff that makes the system sustainable, would be about $146 million per year. What we've also broken down is if folks want to think about this as trying to tackle it one age group at a time, the same way we've tackled pre k four, then this graph also shows you here's what it costs to take care of take care of 100% of the unserved need for each of the ages as we work our way down to birth. And while I know that uh, I don't have a magic wand, um, we want to be intentional on using all the resources that we have as best as we can. And I think that this is a no brainer when anyone would take the time to read the studies, children who arrive at school prepared to learn do much better. And education is a basic need that will benefit this entire community. So everyone has a vested interest in this, whether you have a child or not. And all of these entities and businesses that operate here in New Orleans, they've got a vested interest in this too. The better educated our population, the more likely it is that, um, that we will attract uh, uh, more folks to come with better paying jobs and companies that can come here that need a more educated workforce. This is a, a building block that I think that will benefit us exponentially in the long run. So I'm hopeful that um, we can get enough folks to buy in to the need of this, the necessity of this, and the importance of it, because everything is based on what we do with our children. And I have said this repeatedly, I will continue to say this, that we will never arrest our way out of crime. We gotta stop creating criminals. We've gotta make our children prepared so that the option of doing something criminal, nefarious or untoward is something that they never consider. We've gotta put them in a position where success is something that they can see and easily believe that they can attain. And right now, I don't think we've got a system in place that's doing that. And that's why I think we have so many of our kids that come off the rails because we haven't equipped them to stay on. So with that, um, we will continue these conversations because this is not going to go away. We've got to address this and you all have a part in an ally and me in trying to make it happen. I know that there are discussions happening in the state now about the potential of marijuana being uh, decriminalized and then eventually legalized. If that happens, I would hope that uh, we would be able to use some of the taxes from that revenue to fund as a direct funding source for this. We've got to figure out a way to get money into this need, and I'm intentional on trying to do that. So anyone that has a suggestion, please bring it, and I look forward to working with you. I see Councilmember Palmer, you had a comment? No, I just want to thank y'all um, for what you're doing, and, and I'm behind y'all 110%. Um, I think you saw that from our comments earlier um, in this meeting, and you know I'm I'm you know we've had these conversations with OPSB, and it's nothing against OPSB, but really I think we all know that when we look at leveraging resources and limited resources, it makes so much more sense to invest in our little ones um, now than um, than what we have to do you know clean up in the future, right? And so um, I'm there with you. I'm, I would really hope that our colleagues we look at this money very closely um, in terms of the Harris money. And I'd rather it see, see it go to y'all's programs. I know that's just a drop in the bucket, but I'm also curious, where are we with the conversations about millages as well and long-term sustainable funding sources? I know there's been a lot of back and forth with that. And so what, what have y'all come up with? Um, on millages as, as a coalition, we're still sort of working through um, what the future of those efforts look like. Um, as, as you mentioned earlier, Councilmember Palmer, that the previous village in the fall did not pass. Um, and I think the reality of it isn't a lot of funding ideas that aren't some sort of tax that would get us anywhere near close to meeting any of these numbers on the screen. Um, so the reality is, is thinking through who are the partners that we need to get on board and what is the coalition that we need to build to be able to build the public engagement and understanding of this need to be able to meet it. Um, as I'm sure all of you know better than we do, passing taxes is a very difficult thing. Yeah, but I also, I do wanna stress that I really don't think 
that that millage not passing was anti early childhood education as much as it was they wanted to make the library fully funded right and i think i think it was just a shame that we had very similar advocates and it, it became an either or issue as opposed to both end and that was very frustrating i think for me i know personally and professionally and i think for a lot of us because i think a lot of the people that support the libraries obviously understand the importance of early childhood education, right? So I think that y'all kind of got caught up in a, in, in a mess that is not reflective of where I think the public is for funding y'all's programs, right? Um, and so I would, I would like to see another bite at that apple, quite frankly. Um, I, I can, we couldn't agree with you more, council member. Um, and I echo everything you just said. It goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, that obviously we also very much support the libraries. And the exactly, funding. exactly. You know, we, sh we should never be in a position where we're asking folks to fund two very essential services for families and kids. Right. And it's an either or. It should be and. You know, our, our budgets are moral documents that lay out our priorities. Um, and the, having that choice at all is a choice that we don't, a choice that we don't want to have. So couldn't agree with you more that, you know, it should be creating more funding and more resources for, ev for everyone in all types of programs, not trying to pick between one or two. I couldn't agree with you more. Additionally, I'd like to follow up on Councilman uh, Banks' offer and ask all of the members of the council, the our Early Childhood Funding Task Force, which was convened by the former um, council president, uh, we definitely looked at the possibility that marijuana would be made legal and we wanted to be first at the cut to have funds allocated for early childhood. So we would be glad to be a part. I know I would, and I know Rochelle would, of a coalition that prioritizes that. putting fund, putting what a part of whatever tax revenue to building the future of our state by building the future of our children. Yes. And if I could just add like two very short things. Um, one, um, Councilman Banks, since you brought it up, there is a current effort around funding at the state level for y'all to look into. There's a conversation happening about sports betting, which I'm sure all of you guys have heard of. Um, that legislation to legalize sports betting was passed with a campaign that talked about funding early childhood with that money. Thus far, the legislature has not come, true, come through with that promise. Um, and so if you're looking for an opportunity to work with your colleagues at the state level, that's something that's happening right now as we speak that the conversation about what to do with that sports betting taxation dollars um, and where to dedicate it, or if to dedicate it at all, is currently happening. So that's a place to engage. The second thing I would say um, is there's also a lot of talk right now about stimulus funding related to childcare, uh, which is why we have the last slide, slide number seven. I just wanted to clarify for folks that the very large number you may have heard about of almost $800 million that the state is receiving for childcare, I just wanna remind folks that it's one-time funds. It's one-time funds that must be used over the next three years. And very specifically, the legislation says that you have to supplement, not supplant services. Right. Um, and so any sort of illusions that, oh, we just got almost $800 million from the feds, this problem is solved, that is not true. What this is, is this is a one-time in, 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 um, influx of money, similar to what the city of New Orleans is getting, that is gonna cover a lot of losses over the last 18 months. It's cover a lot of help for folks that really need it. But at the end of the day, this isn't something that it's gonna be sustained over time that we can say, well, we don't have to solve this problem now. So I just wanted to make sure that I made that point because $800 million is a large number, but it is one time. So Mr. Francis, I'd like to, um, can, I, can I talk with a little, a little, let's expound a little bit more on that because sure. my question is, it, it has to supplement, not supplant. But if so, if your schools and you have a pre-K four, they could add even for two or three years, right? A pre-K three. That's so, 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 no, so no. So the, the funding that you see on your screen, this is for childcare, which is zero to four, but this is, I, I'm going to get way into the weeds for you here to answer your question. So I apologize. Um, so the pre-K four in the state of Louisiana is funded by LA four. Uh, and what most people don't know is that LA four used to be funded by state general funds. But during the Bobby Jindal administration, what they did is they defunded LA4 and they, they replaced it with TANF funds, normally right. known as cash assistance. What you're allowed to do as a state is you're allowed to use TANF funds for child welfare and for any sort of other services that benefit low-income families. So in the state of Louisiana, 
What we did is instead of spending state general funds to fund LA4, the program we created, we took TANF dollars and we spent it on that, which is why in the state of Louisiana, less than half of 1% of the people who qualify for cash assistance get it. So to answer your question about um, pre-K-4, one of the problems we're actually seeing is that the federal government, because of all of the money it gave out in the American Rescue Act, they're actually lowering the amounts that they're giving to states in TANF. So the reality in Louisiana is that next year, we're actually gonna have less pre-K-4 seats than we did last year because we're losing some funding for pre-K-4 and we do not fund it from any sort of state funds. Um, and so to answer your question directly about pre-K-4 is with, with schools, they're not gonna be able to do that because their funding is actually going down. Okay, I was actually thinking pre-K-3 that if you had to not supplant but supplement, right? Then if you already have an existing pre-K-4, would the money, could the money be used for the creation of a pre-K-3 even if it is just for two or three years? Hypothetically, you could. Um, I think the funding of that would be very tricky because typically zero to three is funded to childcare providers like Rochelle and pre-K-4 is funded to K-12s. And so what that would require is that would require the Department of Education and likely NOLA PS fostering relationships between K-12 schools that have pre-K programs and providers like Rochelle that are childcare providers, because typically you don't see schools, K-12 schools or pre-K-3 programs. It's certainly possible, it's just hard to fund it because the only, real, the only thing that they could fund it with if you were a school is you could fund it with a Head Start partnership with someone like Thelma, you could fund it with CCAP, parents who are paying, uh, who get the subsidy, but as we showed on the screen, the subsidy is not enough. Um, and you could fund it with private pay, and that's basically it. Pre-K pre three, there's just not a lot of funding for that. Okay, because I'm just, I'm even just, I'm just trying to think creatively, right? Because we all know what a short span in a life that is, zero to three. Absolutely. Even knowing that that money could go away, right? It, it would be valuable just to even have a pre-K three for two years, right? I mean, that, that would save a, a tremendous amount of, for children. It would give them, you know, a much more of a head start. It would, it would. Well, I guess my thing is like, I'd, in terms of the funding that schools have to do that, I mean, Dr. Lewis and the, the NOLA PS folks could talk much more um, eloquently about the state of their funding. But I, there, from what I've been seeing in the, in the relief packages, there isn't new funding to be able to do something like that. No, but they, they do have funding. My understanding is that they, they can partner with nonprofits. They can call people in to do additional services, right? So you can't, you can't pay teacher salaries, but if you have additional services, you can partner and ask a nonprofit. So I guess my question is, couldn't they then ask a Head Start program to come in if they already have a pre-K four to do pre-K three for two, you know, for two or three years with the, with the money? That, I guess that's what I'm asking. I hear what you're saying. Um, I, I don't know enough about the specifics of that and the rules of what the federal funding can and cannot be used for. What I can say is that there are certain examples. There are definitely examples of that happening in other places in the country. In Louisiana, because of the way that we do things, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and then when you add the fact that we have a decentralized system of schools in New Orleans, that adds another level of complications to that on funding. Um, and so hypothetically, yes, I can definitely, I can think of examples in other parts of the country where there are partnerships like that. Whether or not that's feasible in our context, I, I don't have, I don't know enough information to comment on that. Can I, just I make a comment just based on uh, early learning provider? I, I don't want there to be an adverse action where now three-year-olds are going into the school system and taking away from the community early learning providers who um, have, um, it'll have an adverse action. We're already struggling, but if you take our three-year-olds out of our, even for two years, you may see early learning centers close. Um, it is very, very expensive to take care of infants and toddlers, as you can see. Um, so a lot of centers go and they take care, you know, they take care of three-year-olds, three and four-year-olds, mixed preschool classrooms and do a very, very good job. So I would just want to be careful and say, not have all of our three-year-olds go into the school system or just into Head Start. We, we need to make sure that it is equitable across the board for Head Start, as well as early learning providers, private centers um, going forward. No, you're 100% you're correct, Ms. Wilcox, and thank you for bringing that up. I think what, what we're thinking, what I was, what I've been talking, I've been talking to a lot of school leaders about this, 
and what what they're what the way they're interpreting it is that they could create the partnership right say with your organization or with head start not create one within the school right but then to partner which would make it a lot more feasible it would it could happen more quickly right and because the, the funding's limited you're going to be more um able to be to be responsive than them creating a whole new program within a short amount of time I, and, and just to, just to add on to that, um, Councilmember Palmer, um, what you're describing is something that has happened in the past, specifically with pre-K-4. I can think of examples, including a school that I personally worked at that had a relationship with a provider like Rochelle, whereas they, they shared funding with a childcare provider who provided X amount of seats for kids for pre-K-4. So in the example I'm talking about, I was a pre-K-4 teacher working at the school. I was an employee of the school. The other two classrooms of pre-K-4 that existed at the school were actually classrooms that were provided by a provider, a childcare provider like Rochelle that was down the street from the school. And so those kids were part of the school. Those kids were enrolled in the school for kindergarten. Those teachers from that childcare center did professional development with us. There's definitely examples of partnerships like this that have happened in the past. Um, and so again, it is certainly possible for it to happen. I, I guess I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the funding just isn't adequate. Um, Cause like, even with all that I said about LA4 and that it's funded by TANF, one of the things that I left out is it's funded at half day. And so one of the issues that I faced personally when I was a pre-K4 teacher is that I got paid less than the other K-12 teachers because the school only got half the funding for my kids that they got for the kindergarten kids. Because again, in the state of Louisiana, we haven't decided to actually fund this. We've just mostly siphoned off some federal funding for it. So for example, on average, you get about 10,000 per child for a child that is in kindergarten through 12th grade. For a child that's in pre-K four in Louisiana, you get half of that because it's technically only funded at half day. Right. But half day pre-K four doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help the parents, it doesn't help the kids, it doesn't help the school, that, that is not feasible. And so what every school that has a pre-K four program that is funded by LA four, they all take a hit on their budgets by getting half the amount for each pre-K four kid that they have. And so it creates this reality where there's a disincentive to actually provide this service to the community. Uh, it creates a reality where pre-K four teachers are often paid less. And it makes what you're talking about, Council Member Palmer, these like really advantageous, advantageous um, partnerships that could happen where you have people like Rochelle who are these community experts that could really provide high quality care where those partnerships don't happen because there just isn't enough money to go around. And I would like to add that initially the design for the Mahalia Jackson Early Learning Center was based upon a shared model. Uh, there was co-enrollment and at four year old moved to the school board part and we shared a operational budget. I think it is being consistent and ensuring there is the funding to make those types of models continuously work. I know that uh, from the National Head Start side, that is one of the models that they would talk about, that they advocate the innovation to better utilize resources. And Kenny says to me, don't go too far in that continuum. But I think it is incumbent upon us that we develop a continuum of opportunities that better utilizes all of our funds. I would like to add one other thing though. Louisiana is the lowest paying state in the child care block grant in the nation. This came really to my knowledge as we began to do EHS CCP, which is the Early Head Start Child Care Partnership, where to increase the number of early Head Start slots in communities of high need, we partner with child care partners to provide, but we are leveraging Head Start funds with the child care block grant. And because Louisiana is the lowest paying state, because we do not put up a cash match. We use the child care tax credit to match the federal dollars. Uh, we're still hindering quality. We are increasing availability, but we're expecting Cadillac quality with a Pinto budget. <laughs> That's a great way to put it, Ms. French. I think the simplest way I can put it is that when you look at the funding for publicly funded seats for zero to four in the state of Louisiana, over 90% of that funding comes from the federal government. And so the reality is we're simply not doing our part at the state level to fund this really essential service that our kids and our families desperately need. 
Well, tell me one thing for sure. If you are funding a pinto budget, you're going to get a pinto result. And I think that's why we all need to be working towards getting closer to getting, if we can't get a Cadillac, at least let's just get a Chevrolet because clearly the pinto is not working. Yes, I agree a hundred percent. And we again, thank you Correct. for your leadership. Colleagues, are there any other questions? All right, seeing none, thank you all. And we will continue this discussion. I truly appreciate your, uh, your help today. And trust thank me, you will be hearing from us again. Thank you. Moving thank on you. with the agenda, I'd like to introduce uh, Gabriel Morley, who is executive director of the Orleans Public Library. And Gabe is going to talk about the high school degree program a presentation on the programs and workshops that are specifically geared for parents, caregivers, and educators, focusing on the years from birth to five. So Gabe, good morning and welcome. And thank you for having me and, and amen to early childhood education, right? We're, we're cleaning it up here on the back end, dealing with some of the, the results of, of that lack of, of education at the beginning. All right, so today, uh, let me see, do I need to share my screen and do the presentation? Okay. All right, so today I'm going to talk about uh, career online high school. You may have read about this in the, the newspaper recently, or you may have heard about it already uh, before. It's a program we have, uh, and, and I do want to say this up front. After the article ran in the newspaper, we had a lot of calls from people around the country who wanted to, to take part in this. So this is a, a local program. Let's stipulate that at the beginning. This is for Orleans Parish residents who are over 19 years old, who have finished the eighth grade, and who don't have a high school diploma. Uh, you know, they, we know there's about 50,000 of these people or so in the, the city and the, the parish. So we, we have a, a targeted demographic. We, we don't need to be worried about the, the folks in Florida and New York. They can, can work out their own programs. Uh, some of the benefits uh, of this program, uh, it, it's a free program. There's no cost to the, the students who participate and enroll in this program. The library covers the costs of this. Uh, no real money changes hand between students and, and provider. You know, the, the library has purchased these seats and a student who qualifies and enrolls in the program is, is admitted for free. Uh, another advantage of the program, obviously, is that it's 24 seven. It's online. It's you're able to, to do this at your own pace. You go at your own speed. You have a one on one mentor that helps you along. And that's a real advantage for people who can't take uh, part in our in person classes where we partnership with the Y here at the main library. Uh, to do face-to-face -face classes. Obviously, those run, you know, like a standard school schedule. So this online 24-7 format is really uh, useful for a lot of people. Uh, you can see a few other things on here. This, this presentation is informational. You can keep this. You can share this around to, to your constituents. Uh, part of what we're trying to do here is get the word out about this program. Uh, another interesting feature of this is it does not lead to a GED or a, a high set. This is an actual high school diploma from an accredited school, and uh, they have, you know, certified teachers. I mean, it's a, a fully vetted program. Uh, this program has been in existence since 2010. Uh, it, it, it's a worthwhile program for, for people who have a need and have a little bit of, of self-motivation. All right, let's take a look here. Uh, we currently have 18 students enrolled, which is great news for us. We went for a while with uh, a low enrollment. Uh, after our, our publicity a few weeks ago, we, we've been able to, to gather up a few more students. You can see we've had seven graduates so far, including one this month. That's great news for, for us, but more importantly, it's great news for them. I mean, we're, we're trying to lift all boats here, uh, and so we need more people to, to participate and get where they need to be. So the, the part that may be most important for you and, and what we're really hoping you can, can help catalyze is we still have 29 slots remaining. So we, we paid for these slots. They're available. We know there is a, a market for this. The people are out there. We just need to, to get to those people. So we're, we're asking for some, some help on promoting this. Uh, it's a very simple process to get started. 
people can either call the library or they can come to, to one of their branches and get started. Uh, they can take an online pre-assessment and see sort of where they are on the, the scale and, and how far along they may be, what sorts of activities uh, they may be required to do. Just gives them a little bit of a heads up about what some of the expectations are. Uh, we're also committed to this program for another year. So if someone can't make it today or they feel like, oh, I'm too busy right now, I, I wish I could do this in another month or so, uh, that will still be an option. Uh, this is just a, uh, another slide that sort of reiterates some of the things we've talked about. Um, you know, people who are interested in this program really should reach out. I mean, I, I think there's a stigma around not being a high school graduate the same way there is about not being able to read very well. Uh, doing this in your home, you know, online is a very uh, easy way of doing this without having to, to really get out and announce you know, everything that's happening in your life, you can sort of do this under the radar. Uh, it's an easy process to get started. We've even got some folks at the, the YMCA who can help walk you through it. Uh, we give you a library card, you know, you take that, that pre-assessment, you get enrolled in the courses. And some people finish in as quickly as five months. I mean, it's not a thing where you say, oh, I, I don't have three or four years to commit to this. Like I said earlier, it, it's self-paced and self-directed. So if, if you can start knocking out some of these things and get into a good rhythm and you have some time, uh, some people have finished in, in five months. Uh, if you look on the, the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see in conjunction with earning your high school diploma, you can also uh, tailor your, your, your studies around one of these career paths. So if you know there's something that you're really interested in and it's related to one of these, you know, childcare and education uh, might be a great one. We've just had some, some thorough discussions about that. Uh, the hospitality industry we know is, is big here in the, the city. Uh, if you're interested in those, you can, can align those with the curriculum as you go. And it just gives you another little leg up, which is what we're trying to do. We, we want to give people a hand up, you know, not, not necessarily a handout. And maybe the, the most salient thing for a, a lot of people uh, is that high school graduates earn a lot more money than, than those who have not earned their, their high school degree. So if you're motivated by money and you see that big figure, you know, that should be another reason that compels you to come on into the library, try to get signed up for this program, and, and really not only help yourself, but, but help your family. You know, the, the people coming up behind you are going to look at you and, and uh, they're going to have those same high expectations. And truly, this is, is one of those efforts like early childhood education that, that helps get people on a path to do bigger and better things, which is what we're all about at the library. I think that's all I have today, unless there's some questions. Nope, that was it. Any questions? A hey, couple of questions. Uh, what's the requirements for an individual to participate? They have to be over 19 years old. They have to be an Orleans Parish resident and we'll give them a, a library card. Uh, and they have to have finished the eighth grade. You know, they, they have to have at least finished a junior high, you know, to get into this program. And we have some people look, you know, you went to high school for three years and dropped out, that's fine. You went to high school for one year and dropped out, that's fine. You went to high school for half a year and didn't even finish half a year, that's fine. As long as you're over 19 and you finished eighth grade, and you, you have a Orleans Parish address, you're good to go. And then where does an individual go to actually sign up? I didn't hear that part, it was modulating. Where does an individual go who wants to participate? How do they get enrolled? They can call the library, first of all, and we can walk them through the process, you know, ensure they have a library card, make sure they meet all the requirements. They could also come down to the main library. They could really go to any branch of the main library. But most people, their first step is to take the online assessment. You know, that, that gives them some idea of where they are on this, this path toward uh, earning their degree. It also will give them some more information about what they need to do. So starting at the website is a good spot. If you don't have internet access, come on down to the library. You can accomplish two things at once. And you talked about us helping. How is it that we can help to get this out? Tell me what you need us to do. Yeah, push, push this program out to as many of your constituents uh, as you can. You know, we, we would rather have more people and buy more seats than have seats you know, that are empty. So, you know, if you can get this into the, the hands of your constituents, get it out to some pastors, get it into some, some churches, 
you know, where, where there may be people who are reluctant to hear this message or uh, people who may not uh, necessarily be receptive to this message in a public way. You know, they, they may want to get this information and then find out about this on their own. You know, there's a, a little bit of, of shame around this in, in some ways. And so that's another obstacle we're trying to overcome as we get the word out about this. I think that this is a, a fabulous opportunity and it just dovetails into what I've been saying since I've been here. The more opportunities we give people to be successful the more likely they are to take those opportunities on and keep them out of doing something that none of us want people to do. So I will gladly um, personally commit to uh, getting this on my website and getting this spread as much as we can. I see the council president. Um, so apparently she'd like to speak. Her face is showing. So good morning, ma'am. Welcome. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I, was, uh, I very much agree with, with everything that you've just been um, saying and um, Gabe, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, a, a couple of quick questions though. I think this program is, is really fantastic. Um, and, and you're right, Mr. Morley, there are you know, some barriers um, for, for some individuals to, to go forward with getting their high school diploma. And one of them might be even, you know, I can't even afford supplies, a computer or, or whatever I may need to, to try to get into one of these um, programs to get a diploma. So while while this particular program is free, what about for supplies and computers and things like that? Is there is there any type of assistance on, on that front? Oh, uh, we have our, our internet access in the libraries. You know, this is a program they could complete. You know, if they have the, the time uh, when we're open, they can come in, use our computers, use our internet access. Uh, I don't know how much, you know, supplies, I mean, maybe, you know, pencil and paper, depending on, on how much notes they take, but, you know, that would depend on each different student. Uh, we are hoping that, that some of the stimulus money we can use to purchase equipment, uh, the ARP money is sort of dedicated to uh, expenses that are not used inside the library. So our preliminary discussions have revolved around trying to to purchase some equipment and some hot spots that may be a bridge to a, a much more robust uh, universal broadband type uh, uh, program. So in the short term, you know, uh, right now they're going to have to come into a library or borrow, you know, uh, uh, equipment from someone else for a period of time as they do their studies. Yeah, let's let's see if we can work on trying to to get some equipment for this program too, because if it's going to be a twenty four seven thing and you've got someone who's you know working throughout the day and you know probably has a couple of kids that they have to you know worry about feeding and putting to bed at night that. After all that's done, maybe that's when they feel like they can start really focusing in on their on their high school diploma sure. and you know, a time when a, when a library is going to be open. So if we can figure out a way to provide them with equipment, that would also, I think, be beneficial for this program. And I'm happy to, to, to try to do all that I can to assist with that piece, too, because I know that there's some nonprofits who, are, who really helped out schools in that regard. And I'm wondering if they could also help out the library with that. Um, so anyway, just something that I, let's see if we can work on, on that piece too. Um, and then the other two questions I had were really about, um, uh, you, you said you get a, a diploma. So what school do you get a diploma from? Is it the NOPL high school or what's the diploma from? No, this, this, right, well, right now the Career Online High School is in transition. So the company that started this program back in 2010 uh, has sold the program to another uh, provider. And so we're, we're still waiting to find out. We're going to have that transition here uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, that's why we went ahead and committed to another year. We're really bullish on what this new company is going to be able to do and how they're going to be able to move this forward. Gotcha. And then, um, you know, this, this kind of kind of goes along with the strategic outreach plan, which I know you all are working on. Um, you know, I'm, of course, just like council member banks, more than happy to put this out on my social media and spread the word. Um, but I think this also goes into, as we really work to promote and market, uh, the library and what the library has to offer, I think this too, and, and I mentioned it to Michelle Thomas, when we talked about the, the, the plan about how do we really get the word out on all of the different wonderful things that the library offers, including a, a plan here or a program here that allows for someone to get a free high school diploma. 
I mean, that is, that's really fantastic. And, um, and something that we should be promoting and marketing and how, how can the library really amplify its promotion and marketing piece um, to highlight all the good things that you all do do. So that was more of a statement and not really a question. Um, but anyway, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Morley. And I think we'll be seeing you uh, again in just a bit for our next meeting. Thank you, Council Member Bank. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, colleagues, any other comments? I do, Jay. This is Cindy. Cindy, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Gabe, so you mentioned that if uh, those that don't have their GED or high school diploma, they could still apply. I think that's great. But do you guys take it to the next level to connect them to one of our GED program to help them get their GED? Uh, maybe. Maybe. You know, for, for people who are not interested in, in this program, we have our face-to-face -face program that, that's a partnership with the YMCA where they can come in and the, the Y works with them uh, based on where they are, where the individual is, you know, on this spectrum, uh, on that path to the, the high set or the GED. It's a, it's a much more engaged program face-to-face. -face. You know, this one is really built for online learning. All right. Thank you. I definitely will be promoting this. This is great. And thank you for doing this for our citizens. I can't tell Cindy if you stop or if you've gotten stuck. Okay. No, I'm done. I'm sorry about that. I missed the chair. Okay. Appreciate Any it. other comments, colleagues? Okay. Well, seeing on Gabe again, thank you. And um, we will continue this conversation. I'll be reaching out to you to get, uh, to get the stuff uh, circulated to my colleagues. I'm sure that all of them are willing to, uh, to help in this effort and put it on their social medias and throughout their network. So I'll be reaching out to you to get the, um, the electronic stuff or whatever you do to get it so we can get it posted. Um, so with that, um, if there are no other questions from my colleagues, I want to repeat that we did not have any public comments, so there are none to read. And I will enter. Oh, I'm sorry. Madam President, go ahead. Before we adjourn, just um, kind of for, for all the members to, to know and for the public too, um, we're going to take a quick break between the end of this committee and the ad valorem committee. So let's go ahead and start the um, dedicated revenue and ad valorem committee at 1215. Okay. That work for everybody? All right, I'm looking at it to work for you. It just gives us a quick little uh, 10 to 15 minute break. Works for you, Mr. Morley? Great, we will see you then. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Morley, I'm glad it works for you. All right, um, with nothing else for community development, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved. Second. Moved and second, so all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. So Aye. with that, we, we stand adjourned. And please, everybody continue to wear your mask and get a vaccine if you have not received one. With that, thank you all and take care. We're done.